happy to have back on Dahlia Lithwick, a journalist with Slate, senior editor there. She's host of Amicus, the podcast, MSNBC contributor, and the author of the New York Times bestselling book, which we talked about on the show, Lady Justice, Woman, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. Dahlia, how are you? Welcome back on. It's nice to see you. It's good to see you, Dean. How are you? Doing pretty good, you know, fighting the fight. It never ends, Dahlia. Just even when you think it's going to get a little better, there, but there have been harsher times. So let's talk about the law, the, some of the legal stuff. First of all, I want to get your reaction. Last night, we learned the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the fake judge, air quotes, Alien Cannon's ruling with the special master. And she was really just doing Trump's bidding. And essentially, unless this gets overturned, it ends the special master completely. From your point of view, was it significant, especially with their language that we're not going to write a rule that allows only former presidents to have a special sort of powers and privileges and rights? It's so significant and even more significant that you have two Trump judges and another Republican appointee. This is not like a bunch of Obama judges. This is, you know, Bill Pryor, the the chief judge of the 11th Circuit, who's been carrying water for the Federalist Society, you know, from the beginning of his career. So it's incredibly significant that the contempt with which they treated Judge Cannon's conduct is just seeps through every page of this decision. And I think it's important that they essentially say ex-presidents don't get special rules. And if we were to construct a special rule for ex-president, this would fundamentally like alter, you know, checks and balances and the ways we think about uh, constitutional democracy and separation of powers. So Dean, I have to say, if I had written this myself as a like hippy dippy lefty, I couldn't <laughs> have done a better dunk on this judge. And, you know, it raises real questions about how long he can stall this out going forward with appeals. But as you said, this is over. I mean, this doesn't go back to her for a second look. They blew the whole thing no. up. And Judge Pryor, I had Jen Taubon yesterday, who reminded us that Judge Pryor had said something about you and Ellie Mistal. So <laughs> we won't have to get into that. When I had Ellie on, we talked about it in more length what had happened, this ridiculousness of it all. So Trump's biggest tactic is delay. Do you expect he'll appeal this to the Supreme Court? And what do you think the prospects of success or even at least a slight delay are? I don't think he, I mean, he, yes. He's going to appeal because that's his sure. go to play. Right. What else does he do? He's appealed his whole life. I think that he has two simultaneous moves. He will probably do both of them. Dean, he will ask for en banc review at the 11th Circuit, which means the, you know, not just these three judges, but a whole the whole panel. He may get it. Uh, he will probably still lose there. <laughs> He's, you know, once you've lost uh, uh, Judge Pryor, Chief Judge Pryor, you've lost. He will also, I think, go to the Supreme Court because he continues to labor under the belief that he owns them. Uh, and right. I think he's going to lose there, too. I mean, they've already batted back one of these. You know, he tried to rush something to the court and he they've batted it back. I don't think and, and, and you know, query whether and I can't answer this. He wants to run this out to the place where he is the actual nominee, at which point there are political considerations about whether this goes forward, but I don't think he can stall that long. And I think what you're going to see really quickly is that the machinery that the Justice Department has put in place is going to start barreling along. So I don't think he can run out the clock this time, but I've been wrong before. The And I had a caller earlier who channels so much of my views that the, the special counsel, great, but Trump should have been indicted a long time ago. That's part of what's happening. When you see the special counsel now and like this decision, any objective indicator that maybe Trump's going to be charged or we that's all pure speculation at this point? And we're just waiting to see how it plays out. I, I think we're speculating. And I think most folks who purport to have some deep knowledge of what's going on there are just spitballing. So I don't want to sort of join the spitball choir. <laughs> but I will say, I think that this is very much an investigation that knows that it's under the gun. It knows that the clock is running and it knows, you know, it's about to inherit all the January 6th, you know, that that is going to become part of the operation. So I have confidence uh, that the special counsel has the ability and the capacity to do what he needs to do. I think we're in a foot race. I think this is just a, a time problem. 
And I also want to just add, because I agree with you, if Trump were anyone else in the world, he would be in jail right now, right? And that is like what we are all having to <sighs> cope with. But I also think, you know, for the folks who are mad at Merrick Garland, who are mad at special counsel, who are mad at January 6th, like there's so many people to be mad at. But I think this is a person, Donald Trump, who has spent his entire life to perfecting the evasion of accountability. He's so good at this. Yep. And so the only question is whether the kind of nutters who continue to represent him in court and judges like Eileen Cannon, the nutters who defend him, can somehow make this last longer than is is reasonable. I don't think they can. I think he's running out of road. And while I've been critical of DOJ, I've never been critical of the January 6th committee. There are some people are, even on our side. And I'm like, I don't know why. Could they move a little faster? Yeah, I guess so. But they're not a charging body. It wasn't a criminal prosecution. They were doing investigative for legislative goals that may or may not pass. And they're still going to give a report. And we'll see if anything passes on that. But that was – and giving the report to DOJ maybe helps that. So we'll, I'm talking with Dahlia Lithwick. So, Dahlia, quick thing, but then I want to get to the big oral argument next week in Moore versus Harper – which is really raising a lot of red flags for people and concerns about the GOP trying to be above the law when it comes to partisan gerrymandering. They literally just do whatever they want. But just one quick thing. With Elon Musk, and before before we started tonight, because we're live, right, before we were chatting for a second here about Elon Musk, he gets rid of Kanye West, but he lets on an actual Nazi. You know, Elon <laughs> Musk is parroting some Nazi stuff, and there's also an intersection of some mental health issues, not as an excuse, but as a reality. We know that this guy... Andrew England is a real self-avowed neo-Nazi who literally wrote, just I was looking at Southern Poverty Law Center, that his guiding principle is what would Hitler do? Literally, this is what his guiding, I'm not kidding, this is what he writes about. And there is there any, so people understand, is there any First Amendment right that Andrew England had to go on this? And was it just the, the idea of Elon Musk for some reason wants to help give a platform to someone who is the best known neo-Nazi in America? Yeah, this is a funny one for one switch, right? Like I let <laughs> Kanye on, then I boot him off again for saying stuff that is vastly less objectionable than the stuff I just let Andrew Anglin on for, right? Like it's insane. Right. And I think the deeper issue, I mean, you're, you're a lawyer, you know this better than me. Like there's no First Amendment implications here because this is a private, you know, this is not a, a, a public government forum. This is I would say the reason the First Amendment exists, the First Amendment exists so that individuals who see themselves as sort of would-be kingmakers, would-be arbiters of what is truth, don't get to willy-nilly say, you you know, you get a car and you don't get a car and you have a platform That's and you fine. don't. I mean, this is why we don't allow it, right? <laughs> because nobody should be the arbiter. And the idea that you have in one side of his mouth, Elon Musk saying, no, I'm for like free speech. I'm going to encourage free speech. And then taking up upon himself without process, without appeal, the <laughs> power to boot people off and let other people on. Like this is in fact what the founders were terrified of is like a king who uh, arrogated himself the power to do that. That's what we're living with. So I don't think anyone should fall for the kind of, oh, I'm just for everybody you know, can speak freely until I decide they can't. That's not a, a First Amendment consideration in the first instance. Certainly it's not a power I choose to give over to Elon Musk. And, you know, we had a call earlier and I, I try to make the distinction, but the idea of the ACLU defending the Nazis in Skokie was because it was state action. So the First Amendment is involved. And while I think the Nazis are despicable, I do agree with the Brandenburg test, essentially, that if you're not going to imminently incite violence or lawlessness, even if I hate them, the government should not get involved. What Elon Musk has nothing to do with the First Amendment. He literally extended a privilege to the leading neo-Nazi in America to be on his platform. And to me, that is, by design or not, normalizing neo-Nazis. That's how I view it. And, and, and let's remember, I think you and I have talked about this before. I mean, I know you've had your history with him. You know, I am a, a Andrew Anglin, who lived horrible. in, oh. he's horrible. And I lived through Charlottesville 2017 and all of the Nazis there who purported to cloak themselves in Skokie and in, you know, all the idea that they are just, you know, innocent guys who happen to be marching around with flaming torches armed to the teeth, right? With, with, with flagpoles that they're going to use to kill people and 
still they think that's protected free speech. That was put to the test, right? We saw a mm -hmm. courtroom in Virginia that said, actually not. That is incitement. It is violent racial incitement. We are smart enough to know the difference. So the fact that Elon Musk seemingly is not smart enough to know the difference between protected free speech up to and including Brandenburg, right, incitement, and people who actually say no into the ovens, no, this is not complicated. The First Amendment has nothing to do with it. I think it's really funny, too, like Janine Pirro, who is, uh, she is a lawyer. I don't know what kind of real judge she was, but she was, I saw an article today from something said on Fox News about with Elon Musk and that what ha the founders of this nation expected free speech. And I'm like, and then they would have defended even these Nazis and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think you, do you not know John Adams and the Alien Sedition Act? You don't know they put people in jail for mocking John, a person in Newark, because I wrote about, told a joke about John Adams and could, that violated the law because he mocked the president and he didn't have the money for the fine. So he went to jail for mocking the president of the United States. That's what the founders, some of them were about. So don't, I really think freedom of speech in America it's really Brandenburg on because look, Lenny Bruce went to jail for jokes that the in New York City that people didn't like in World War One with the Espionage Act and and um, the socialist leader Eugene V. Debs went to jail for advocating peacefully against the war. People have this. They I think most Americans don't know our history, learn our history. We're in a much better place in freedom of speech today than we were even 1950s and mid 1960s. Yeah, that's right. And I would go so far as to say that, you know, we've fallen in love with this notion of the marketplace of ideas, right, which yeah. is a construct. But the problem is Elon literally is in charge of an actual marketplace <laughs> of ideas where he's charging you $8 for the right to talk. Like it's not anything close to the notion of everybody gets to talk and then good ideas like, you know, surface to the top and bad ideas are trammeled. That was at least the notion of this marketplace mm -hmm. metaphor. Now it's literally being monetized. This is not what the framers had in mind. So I don't know how, I mean, we're going to have to have a much longer talk about how long you stick around in something that is now you know, know. a platform I'm for, very for actual Nazis. But I completely agree with you. I think it is the most fatuous thing to talk about this in First Amendment terms. No. And I'm talking with Dahlia Lithwick from Slate, best-selling author of the book, Lady Justice, Woman, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. A great holiday gift. Holidays are coming up, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you want, Kwanzaa. So let's talk Wednesday, this Wednesday coming up, very big Supreme Court oral argument, in case Moore versus Harper coming from the North Carolina Republicans, and they want to do partisan gerrymandering, and they didn't want essentially to be above the law, that no one can get involved. Can you share a little bit, like a summary of it a little, and then I can dig down asking you a few questions about it? Yeah, I mean, this is, such, what do you do when you have simultaneously the single most important case probably of the decade that nobody understands wow. and can wrap their head around? I mean, this right. is a hugely consequential case. I think it will inflect not just on the 2024 elections, but all elections going forward. And it's so abstract that nobody can quite pin it down. This short version, Dean, is that, as you said, North Carolina, the legislature did an unlawful gerrymander. The North Carolina Supreme Court said, oh, hell no. And the legislature said, rooted in a, <laughs> an opinion from Bush v. Gore, that Chief Justice, then Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote that got three votes, not a majority opinion, in a case that's supposed to not count, right? right. <laughs> Bush v. Gore. Oh, no, mm -hmm. it's possible that legislatures, state legislatures have plenary, that means unreviewable, boundless power to set election uh, uh, proceedings. It was never a majority. It's not a doctrine. Please don't let people tell you that the you know, independent state legislature doctrine is rooted in text or history or, in fact, precedent. It's made up in the undergrad labs of the conservative legal movement. And if, in fact, the court blesses this, and I should note parenthetically, we have four sitting justices who are very read. interested in this case, oh. who have suggested in different cases that they think this might be a cool idea. If, in fact, the court blesses this, then you are going to have state legislatures doing whatever they want for elections, and it will be unreviewable by state Supreme Courts. It will be un nothing that the governor can do or anyone can do can touch them. State legislatures, as you said, will have a free hand to set how elections go. And if any of this sounds familiar, think about Donald Trump calling over to Georgia, calling over to Pennsylvania in 2020 and saying, 
give me a slate of fake electors because that's where this could in the worst maximum right. case scenario that's where this could go so and i wanted to get that because if you look at this there's two ways of looking at it. one is that it's about ge partisan gerrymandering where the federal courts already can't review essentially right. so they have to go to state court and you're like well it's gerrymandering with the states is that much of a big deal look in new york if they could not if there was no state review we would have had the house probably because we lost we had this ridiculous map that Democrats had drawn through an independent commission, which gave us four seats, and then we didn't get them, and then we lost four. So the net seven or eight seats here, we 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 would have the House. But the fear is this independent state legislature doctrine could extend to what exactly what you're saying, that some down the road, the state legislature can say, we can ignore the will of the people in this election and just assign the electors to the Electoral College to whoever we want, the person in our party, which was Donald Trump in the past and whoever it is. How likely of a scenario is that's where this would go if this is embraced by this court? We don't even know if this will be embraced, but if it was. I mean, this is the thing we don't know. There are so many iterations of how big or how small the court can go. Right. But I think it's worth thinking about not just, you know, your, your uh, electors, but also voter suppression rules, right, that are enacted by by ballot initiatives that are enacted. Yeah. I mean, it can affect every aspect of how voting is conducted. And we don't really know. All we know is, as I said, there are four justices who seem enchanted by the prospect that state legislatures have unreviewable, unfettered power. And so I think, you know, there's two different clauses. There's the electors clause and the elections clause. This implicates not just state elections, but also federal elections. It's wonky AF. And at the right. same time, if the Supreme Court has any interest in sort of reifying the notion that state courts can't review state legislatures, then I don't think this is anything other than ultimately a power grab by the Supreme Court to determine which kinds of things are going to be okay and which are not. Because the last arbiter of this will be this, the U.S. Supreme Court that's going to decide going forward. Uh, and that's a terrifying prospect, too. So for a Supreme Court that purports to value states' rights, that purports to say that states, you know, have deserve dignity, remember, Shelby County, they're about to eviscerate the power of, as you said, state voters to be heard. And in case you're wondering of the judges who are like this, the three that are definitely love it are Alito, Clarence Thomas, and Neil Gorsuch. And Brett Kavanaugh finds it, he is curious about that. He, he seems to have some interest in it, which is worrisome if they get one more. We don't know what the decision could be. It could be crafted differently. I've read some articles, there's so many articles about it now, that they can make a decision and not even touch this independent state legislature thing. They can just address the gerrymandering thing and not get into it. But we have to be aware of the potential worst case scenario. And if it's all legally wonky to you folks, just understand it's bad. OK, if you like democracy, if you want to usher in electoral autocracy, this would be a nice way of doing it without even having to storm the Capitol. This is making it legal to do what Trump did. Call up the Speaker of the Assembly and go, hey, give me the vote. Just claim there was fraud. The last thing, we have two minutes left. But, you know, we've talked before about a woman's right to reproductive freedom. And before the election, it was sort of a big issue. It was a big, big issue in the summer and early fall. But now it's kind of elections over, the heat's over. But where we are right now is that 13 states, per the New York Times, have abortion bans at conception at day one and other states contemplating similar things. What can we be doing to raise more attention about this and continue this fight for reproductive freedom, for equality for women, for self-determination? I'm going to say, connect it back to Moore v. Harper and say, oh. if you're asking yourself how you get minority rule, in states, in red states that are well aware that these are positions that don't even command like 10% of the electorate. I mean, just think of the five states in the midterms that put abortion directly on the ballot, right? By ballot initiative. Abortion won every time. People freaking hate this. The reason yep. it's happening is because all of the levers of minority rule. So I am going to go back to Morphe Harper and say, yes, this has to do with abortion. It has to do with activating people, but ultimately it has to do with how we got in a situation where, you know, red state legislatures that represent tiny fractions of, of viewpoints and values are imposing their will on everyone else. We have to fight about gerrymandering. We have to fight about vote suppression. We have to fight about, you know, the independent state legislature doctrine. This is how we vote has to get fixed.
when do we get a vacation, Dahlia? Isn't there a time? Haven't we deserve a little break from all this? And not next week, the week after I'm going on vacation for a week. That might be my vacation. But even then, I use my, I know the January 6th report's going to come out when I'm on vacation. So I'm going to have to, I, that's not a bad time to read it. If it's a long report. I can actually kill time by the pool reading. Dahlia, thank you so much for being on. Again, her book, it's a great book. New York Times bestseller. We covered it in great detail last time. Lady Justice, Women in the Law, The Battle to Save America. A great holiday gift for anybody. Dahlia, thank you, my friend. Have a good weekend. Thanks for being on. Take care. Enjoy your vacation. Well, next week I have to work, but the week after. Thanks a lot. It's, Talk it's to you a soon. It's a team sport, Dean. It's a team sport. It is a team sport. Thanks. Play by the